Welcome back to part two of our four-part series on sharing your faith and how exactly we do that. So today, last week we went over why you share your faith. We saw that we are both uh, a new creation in Christ and that we are also an ambassador of Christ, which is an awesome way to see ourselves in the God's redemptive plan for the entire world. So today, we're going to be going over who do we share with. So instead, last week was why, this week is going to be who. So who do we share with? And this is going to be based on 2 Timothy 2.2. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy 2.2. A little bit of background, this is one of the last letters that Paul writes. So he's writing this to his, his faithful brother. He, he almost looks at him like a son named Timothy. And he is telling Timothy just about how he wants the Word of God to be preached, how he wants people to be shepherded and people to be loved in the church. And he's kind of giving them like a last will and testament because after this, he doesn't know what, what's really going to happen to him. He says uh, in, in 2 Timothy 4, 6, just to give you a little bit of context, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. So what Paul is saying is that God has been faithful to him, and he has been also faithful to God. He has kept the faith, he has finished the race, and he is going to continue to persevere until his life is over. And so in this letter, he gives a lot of very strong just declarations of what he wants Timothy to do, one of which shows up in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. If you're already there, um, we can read it together. It says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So what that passage is talking about is Paul is saying, hey, you know, what I have taught you, so I have discipled you, I have poured into you, I have shown you how to teach the way of God rightly. You need to do that with other people. So I have taught you how to preach right. You need to do that with other people. And when it says men, it can be men and women. So this isn't just a guy-to-guy -guy thing or a girl-to-girl -girl thing. It's anybody can help teach anyone to go and help them reach their neighbors and the world for Christ. So you probably are wondering what all these circles are up here, and no, have no fear, this is what's called an oikos map. So if you've never heard the word oikos, well, you probably haven't had the oikos yogurt at Walmart or wherever you buy it, and it comes from the Greek word that means house. So oikos means house, and so when we think of who do we share with, this is a tool that we see of how you can think of people who are close to you, but are far from God. So that, that's the key. So you have someone who is close to you, but is far from God. And there's a, probably a lot of people in your life. So you drawing this tool out, and this is going to be helpful for you, so I want you to take a piece of paper, draw this out as well, to, to look at who you know who is close to you, who you love, who is far from God. So the first way to do it is to put your name in the middle. So for me, I'm going to put my name in the middle. And this is the center of the oikos because, you know, I'm me. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't too complicated. But basically, you want to put yourself in the middle and think, okay, you know, I'm in the center. But who are some people in my life who I know that are far from God? And, and I want you to try to think of four people in your life who are far from God. For me, I, I, um, I, won't, I won't say that many names, but I think of someone named um, Heidi. So she is one of my neighbors. Um, she is Jewish, and um, I've known her for a while. She's a very friendly person. And basically with her, I have tried to share my faith with her, and she has tried to share her faith with me. But I know that she knows who God is in terms of the Old Testament, but she doesn't know who the person of Jesus is. 
So for me, she lives right, I mean, literally like a few steps away from me. And it would be very easy for me to start some sort of relationship there to go and tell her about the person of Christ. Another person I would think is someone named Zach. So one of the cool things about the church is we had a, a lady in the church named Jerry who came, who came to a faith in Christ. And, we, and she, that happened through us providing a bed for her son, Zach. So Jerry now is in the beginning process of just learning about discipleship, learning what it means to follow God. And Zach is, is her son, and he does not know the Lord. So because he does not know the Lord, he is a great one that we could, that I already have, a, I already have contact with his mom to continue that relationship with Zach and try to share with him. Another person that I would think is one of my friends from college. His name is Mark. So Mark swam with me in college. Um, he lives pretty far away, but we try to keep in contact pretty often. We call each other every few months. And he thinks that there's a God. He believes that there's a God. And he's, he can, would consider himself a spiritual person, but he doesn't believe that Jesus is Lord of his life. And even if you, you know, went to church, he would never say, you know, I'm going to do whatever God calls me to do and go wherever God calls me to go. He likes to kind of do that himself. He's a, he's a very go-getter. And so I know him. I, I can keep in contact with him. And if I called him on the phone, he would pick up and we could have a conversation. So for me, Mark would be someone who I could reach out to who would be in my Orcas. And then the last one, and again, like you probably, one, two, three, you probably get to a point of like, man, you know, who else in my life? Do I know that is close to me, you know, someone who I can reach out to a lot, but but is far from God? And I, th I think the fourth one for me, it's kind of hard to rack my brain for this one just to think, but um, I would think my, my neighbor who lives right next door to me. I, I don't know. Uh, actually, no, uh, we met a guy uh, last week when we were out sharing. His name's Keith. So Keith is someone we literally met this past weekend. We're going out, knocking on doors, asking people how we could pray for him. And he, he grew up Catholic, but he couldn't really under, explain what the gospel was. And he didn't really know who Jesus was or what it looked like um, in, in his life. We tried to ask him, like, all right, you know, could you tell us what the gospel is? And he, he didn't know. We said, like, we, and then we explained to him what the gospel was. Fun fact, if you ever need to explain the gospel, a great way to do that is Romans 6.23. You should, it's a great verse to memorize. Just say it enough. You'll have it memorized. It's for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you, know, you ask him, what is a wage? Well, a wage is something that you earn. Um, okay, so the wages of sin. What's sin? You know, something you do wrong against God. Okay, so the wages of sin is death. Well, it's not physical death because when you sin, you don't die. So it's, it's an eternal death. What we deserve for our sin is eternal death. But God, who is God? Well, creator of the world, every, made everything. Okay, but God, but the free gift of God. Okay, so you have a gift. Can you earn a gift? Well, no, you can't earn a gift. No, like you, you, your grandma loves you. She doesn't give you a gift because you earned it. She can, gives it because you love it. She loves you. And if you think anything different, you're wrong. So... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So instead of having eternal death, we could have eternal life. So you think, okay, you know, what we deserve for our sin is death, but what God offers us in a gift is his son, Jesus Christ, who is the, who is the propitiation of our sins, and he did everything for us to save us. So for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a simple way to explain what the gospel is. And, and Keith couldn't do that for us. So we just asked him, hey, man, like we would love to maybe come back with you next week and just tell you a little bit more about who Jesus is so that you can know for yourself. Like one of the most important things in this world is to know what happens when you die. To think, oh, well, nobody can really know what happens when you die. I think it's a little bit foolish because there's a lot of people who claim to know what happens when you die. And to say that all of them are wrong, but you're right just because it feels right, that's not a good way to think or to go throughout life. You should go throughout life asking, hey, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? And if I believe that it's true, how can I let other people know about it too so that they can come out of their sin 
and into the marvelous light in a relationship with Jesus. So this, very simply, is an oikos map. And one of the things that's really cool is if you think about an oikos map, an oikos map is not just what I tell these four people. Because everybody who is in this oikos is right now far from God, but they know people that I don't know, and they have relationships with people that I don't have. And so this oikos starts with me, one person. Now I think of four people in my life who I, who I know, close to me, far from God. One, two, three, four, five. Five people total. Four without me. Five. But if you include all the people that are in their lives, it goes to 16 plus these four, 20 and 21. So I, through reaching four, can reach 16. And then in that sense can reach 20 people for the person of Christ, 16 of which I never would have had a contact with. Like, I know Mark has friends in Dallas who there's no way I would ever really be able to have a conversation with them about Jesus and they, because they probably wouldn't even hear me. They don't know me. I don't have that relationship with them. But Mark does. Mark can reach those people that I don't know. He can share the gospel with them in a way that I couldn't do it, in, in a way they wouldn't even listen to me. Same thing with Keith. Keith has a relationship with his parents. He knows people who are in his, in his church, even though he doesn't know the gospel. And he could say, hey, let me tell you about what I learned from the Bible. That, you know, God says... For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Like, do you know what that means? Can I tell you about that? You know, for someone like Heidi, she's got a lot of people in her life, a very friendly person who she can talk with. Same thing with Zach. Zach works at Walmart. He can talk with a lot of people at Walmart at his job who are far from God. You see, the beautiful thing about an Oikos map is that you have a few people in your life who you are devoted to and you are in a relationship with that you can talk with every day. But you can't talk with everybody in the world. But the process of reaching the world that Jesus gave us is the process of discipleship. And it's a beautiful thing because God tells us, hey, you know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The first thing that he says is go and make disciples. Make disciples. That was a big thing. Why would Jesus say that we need to make disciples? Well, Jesus spent a bunch of time with 12 guys. One of them betrayed him. And those 12 guys took the gospel literally to the ends of the earth. There's like some 2 billion Christians right now around there. But Jesus spent time with 12 so we don't need to go preach to the billions or even to the millions. We need to go invest in a few, invest in faithful men, so that they can in turn reach the world. If you go back to that 2 Timothy passage, it says, I'll read verse 1 to it. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have been heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. When you are going out into the world, you are going and saying, I'm going to teach you how to be a fisher of men. I'm going to teach you how to teach other people about Christ. The process of discipleship is finding someone who's a little bit younger than you, or maybe even older, but a little bit less experienced than you. You can pour into their life and show them how Christ is working in the midst of what they're doing. It's a beautiful process because you take someone who's broken and take someone who's hurting and you bring comfort and peace into that situation. Just like Christ came into so many people's lives who were hurting, who were broken, who didn't know what to do. And he brought them peace, comfort, joy, and he gave them an eternal hope for a life that goes far beyond what this physical world has to offer. And trust the faithful men and you will reap the rewards bountifully in this season and the next. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for this day, for all that you do for us, for how much you love us, and I pray that you would be blessing, keeping, and guiding whoever's watching and showing them that you, Lord, are the best thing that this world has to offer. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Have a great day.